Today on Coffee with Conrad, we have both the testimony and a ministry spotlight. I'm going to be interviewing Mike Norris. You may remember that I interviewed his mom, Cindy Walters, a while back. Well, there's more to this story, and it's unfolding to this day. Without further ado, here's the interview with Mike Norris from Ride for Him. Hey everybody, it's Conrad from ConradRocks.net. Uh, today I have a treat for you. I have Mike Norris from Ride for Him with a, a testimony and a, what we'd call a ministry spotlight. How's it going, Mike? I'm good. How are you? Well, it was good to finally meet you. I saw you on, on Facebook for months since I moved here. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it was nice to meet you this weekend. I've been looking forward to that Faith Methodist reunion, and I never even went to church there, man. <laughs> you know, I was too. I was. It was really good. Uh, I went to church there in the eighties. From probably, I don't know. I was twelve or thirteen years old when we started going there, and I went until I was probably nineteen or twenty. And uh, you know, I hadn't seen any of those people in a long time. And uh, there, dude, there was a couple of hundred people at the at the homecoming thing Saturday, and and it was just it was excellent to see some of those people. Mm-hmm. The guys from the youth group that I grew up with that I hadn't seen in 20 years, you know, it was it was great to see everybody. You saw Bert, right? I mean, when's the I last did. when's the last time you saw Bert? Dude, it's been a long time. I hadn't seen Bert. I hadn't seen Bert in 20 years. I hadn't seen Jim. I saw Perry. I don't know. I've seen Perry a couple of times over the years, but I hadn't seen Jim or Bert in 20 years, probably. Yeah, that's what I. I had my camera there on my phone. I was taking some pictures, and it was cool how people, their mouth would just open up. And and I'd go up and say, well, okay, when's the last time you saw him? And I said, well, it's probably been 25 years. I'm like, wow, yeah. this, this really yeah. is a reunion, man. It, it rocked. Yeah, man. it was awesome. It was awesome. It was a good time. It was a really good time. We knew that needs to be done again. And uh, I'm sure some of the faith people will, will listen to this, and y'all need to spread the word. That needs to be done again in a year or two. That doesn't need to be another 20 years before that happens. All right. Well, Mike, we what we do here is we do testimonies because they overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. They they help people. And you've got a story. I talked to your mom, uh, Cindy, a few months ago. And uh, yeah. She, yeah. she said you, you had some tragedy that turned into some triumph here. Let, let us Fill us in, man. How did God change your life? Um, I am 44 years old, married, father of three. Uh, my wife's name is Chris. Uh, my kids are, I've got three kids. Irby is nine. McLean is 18. And uh, Christopher would be 22. Fairly average, you know, middle-class America, man. Uh, that's where I was raised. That's where I was born. That's kind of where we are. Uh, I work in the lumber business. My wife's a teacher. Uh, we work, go to church, and chase kids, and that's kind of life. And as far as, you know, dude, I've been a Christian a long time. I've always gone to church pretty much. Uh, the 90s were rough. My 20s were rough. Uh, but uh, other than that stretch in my life, which I think is pretty common for a lot of people, unfortunately, other than that, I've been in church most of my life, uh, but I've always kind of had a foot in the world too. Just that's just the way it's always been. I don't know that I have ever really done my part, so to speak, uh, done what I was supposed to do, so to speak. Um, but uh, everything changed a few years ago. We uh, on Memorial Day. May the 30th of 2011. All right, I'm going to try real hard to get through all this. Uh, and we'll just have to edit it, dude, because I'll, I'll, it'll get tough here at some point. That's fine. Um, other people. Um, anyway, uh, Memorial Day, May the 30th, 2011. My son uh, is actually from my first marriage. I was married young, my high school sweetheart. Uh, his name's Christopher. And, uh, she actually had seven kids in her house. She had, uh, our son, her, uh, she had remarried just like I had, and her husband had one from a previous marriage, so that's two kids. Then they had two kids together, uh, so that's three and four. Then they had been to China and adopted a little girl for five, and then they had two foreign exchange kids living with a little boy, a little girl from, uh, Italy, 
Flavia and a boy from Sweden, Alvin. She had seven kids in her house. It was the Brady Bunch, and I used to make fun of her. <laughs> I right. used to call it the Brady Bunch fan. Uh, Memorial Day weekend, she had taken all the kids uh, on one last trip because they were all fixing to scatter for the summer. The exchange kids were going home. Da 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 da. Christopher was going to Japan on his fourth mission trip. He had been on several mission trips and was well traveled as an 18 year old boy. Uh, he enjoyed it. He enjoyed the work. He uh, he felt like he was making a difference, and, and it was a big part of his life at 18. Um, uh, so everybody was fixing to scatter. They were on the way home. I had let my wife and my two girls go ahead to the country club. I was supposed to meet them, meet them a little bit later that day. Uh, they were there with some friends. I was kind of waiting to hear from Christopher to make sure they got out of Florida okay. I had a couple of honeydews to do. I had heard from him. I was pulling into the country club and my phone rang. And it was Momo. And Momo is my ex mother in law, who I have known since I was 16 years old. So it, it was not unusual for me to get a phone call from her. Uh, so I answered the phone. Hi, Momo. How you doing? And uh, she came here. And so she yells into the phone and she says, uh, Michael? And I said, Hey, Momo. How are you? What's going on? And she said, uh, she said, Michael, she said, there's been an accident. And I said, you know, and I feel bad about this. There's a lot of things that I wish I had done different. My immediate reaction was not, oh my gosh, I hope they're not hurt. My immediate reaction was, I hope the truck's not so jacked up they can't get home. That was my immediate reaction. And I said to her, I said, uh, I said, well, I said, where are they? I said, how's the truck? And I said, is anybody hurt? And uh, and she said, Michael, she said, they're all dead. She said, uh, Christopher and Sherry and Macy, the little adopted girl in Flavia, were all dead. And the other four were hurt and in various hospitals in Meridian, Mississippi. And... Uh, and, you know, well, my immediate reaction was untrue. So I said to her, I said, Mama, are you sure? And she said, Michael, that's what they said. And, and she started rambling. And uh, my immediate thought was, where's Darren? Where's the stepdaddy? So I said, Mama, I got to go. I said, where's Darren? She said, he's driving. He's on the way to Meridian. I said, Mama, I got to go. So I hung up and I called Darren. And, uh, and Darren answered the phone. He was crying. And I said, I said, where are you? And he said, I'm going to Meridian. And I said, I said, are you by yourself? And he said, yeah. And I said, okay. I said, I'm right behind you. I got to get Chris and I'm coming. And I said, uh, I said, are you okay? And he said, yeah. He said, Mike, I'm so sorry. I said, I'm too. No, can't do this right now, dude. I said, you've got to, you've got to suck it up and you've got to get Meridian because you've got four kids of Meridian that are alive and need you. And so you've got to kind of get okay here. And so we talked for a minute and, uh, and he got okay. So I go in and, and get my wife and, and tell her and, and my best friend was there. And that was probably a God thing because, uh, he immediately, I mean, when I walked in the pool to get my wife, he knew something was up. Within just a few minutes, he was coming around the corner. So I went ahead and told him. He took my kids. My wife and I jumped in the car then took out. Um, Meridian, Mississippi is three and a half hours away, you know, so we we had to Meridian. And, you know, I mean, it's a long story. I, I, and we can get lost in the details. I, I remember very distinctly the events of the week, you know, I get the phone call on Monday. We spent most of the day on Monday just trying to get to him. Uh, I found out we got almost to Meridian. I found out that they had taken him to Jackson, Mississippi, to the crime lab there because of the number of deaths there has. There was a mandatory autopsy. So when we found that out, we cut and turned, and uh, we got almost to Jackson, Mississippi, and realized that it was like seven eight o'clock on Memorial Day. wasn't nobody gonna be at the crime lab, and and really wasn't nobody gonna let us in. So we started making phone calls, and you know we didn't even get, we didn't get to see him. They had already ID'd him by dental records. They knew it was him. 
there was nothing for us to do. You know, by that point, there were people in Meridian with Darren and the kids. So we kind of cut home. And honestly, we just drove the whole day, which was not a bad thing, dude, because my wife and I got to spend a, eight or nine hours avoiding the madness that hit South Haven, Mississippi when it happened because it, it exploded like a bomb. And uh, it was everywhere. And everybody, my phone started blowing up and Facebook started blowing up and all this craziness started happening. So, I mean, Monday we found out, Tuesday we spent the day trying to get everybody home, you know, because we got people scattered in two different hospitals and three different morgues. And, and I spent the day, you know, Darren was shattered. And and I spent the day trying to get everybody home. Wednesday we planned the funeral, and Thursday Man. we prepared, and then Friday was the visitation. And you know, we did the funeral all together. There's three caskets, and and you know, mm. there was five or six thousand people that came through. It started at six o'clock, and we saw the last person at eleven thirty. And there's all these kids and they're crying. It was hard. It's hard, you know. And then yeah. Saturday was the Saturday was funeral. And Sunday we go back to church, and Monday I go back to work. And wow, wow! I didn't know what to do, dude. I, I didn't. I had no idea what to do. And, and uh, the people that I work with, I've been there a long time, and they love me, and and they're just almost family. And and they knew, and they let me get, come and go as I please and do what I wanted to do. And it was not a bad thing. Now looking back, I probably would have waited another week or two, but it wasn't a horrible thing to go back to work. Um, it may have been a good thing, you know. Right. Uh, but honestly, dude, the weeks after that are just kind of a blur after that, really. Uh, I drove a lot. Um, I did a lot of driving and a lot of crying and a lot of driving and just riding around and trying to deal with this humongous thing that had happened to me. How was your faith at that time? I mean, what? what, what I was, was angry. Your... I was I was real. Uh, uh, I questioned a lot of things. I questioned everything in those first few weeks. Afterwards, I was mad. There was a day. There was a turning point. You know that those. those I'm telling you, those first few months were blur, and there are moments that I remember. And there was one very distinct moment that I'm I'm doing. I'm driving in my little Ford Focus down the interstate and I'm mad and I'm having a conversation with God and I'm telling him exactly what I think of his plan to take my 18-year-old child. I was not happy. I'm probably going to have to answer for that conversation at some point. But, uh, you know, uh, and I, you know, dude, I'm 40, I was 41 at the time and I'd heard my whole life about people hearing from God and God told me this and God told me that and I ain't never heard from God. I ain't never seen a burning bush. I, there's been points in my life where I knew I was supposed to do something. There was points in my life where I thought God was saying, was telling me, okay, this is where you need to go. This is what you need to do. God never talked to me and, and I'm driving down the road, dude. And it was like, you remember the old tiny bullhorns that people used to stick in their ears to help them hear? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Those great big, those like yeah. tunnels. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 and that's the only way I know to describe it, dude. It's like somebody put one in each ear, and there's people screaming in my ear, and it's John 3.16, and it's, you know, and it's, it fills my whole head. I mean, I cannot, that's the only way I know to tell it, and it's four years later, and I, I don't, that's it. And my whole head filled with God, with John 3.16, for God's love the world, that he gave his only begotten son, so that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. It doesn't, and I, and I, it's it, the word everlasting was like bold print. And I start thinking about it, and I chew on it a little bit, and it, and it says everlasting life. Not life until you smash into a bridge support at 70 miles an hour. It's everlasting life. And it's like God saying, you know, I got him, and it's okay. And it's hard, because I know how I got there. But at that point, I mean, you got to make a choice, man. You either got to decide, I believe, because that verse says right there that he's okay. He has everlasting life because my son believed. And you got to choose to believe or you got to stay in the funk. And I choose to believe. And that's where I'm at. And at that point, it kind of changed. 
and my head started clearing a little bit, and things get better, and I made this list. You know, when something horrible like that happens, there's stuff that has to be done. You know, uh, I got to deal with this truck. I got to call Ole Miss and tell him he's not coming. I got to do all this stuff. And, you know, one of the things that needed to be done was uh, his mom's church had called me and needed a copy of the death certificate uh, so that they could get a refund on his airplane ticket. He, you remember, I told you he was supposed to leave just a few days after the accident for Japan. Uh-huh. And with it being such a short time frame, they couldn't find anybody to fill a spot. So there's an empty spot on the plane, there's an empty hotel room, you know, the whole what. And, and you know, I, I took care of it. I sent them a death certificate, but it, it just really, really, really stuck in my crawl that my son's promise to God was going to get broken. You know, that my, my son's commitment, that's a big deal. You know, you make a commitment. I, I was raised in the church. I may have been a heathen at points in my life, but you make a promise like that to go and be the hands and feet. It's an, it's an important thing. And, and it really, really, really bothered me that his, his commitment was not going to get honored. And it just bothered me. And I thought about it and thought about it and thought about it. Well, not long after that, uh, my church does a uh, a trip to Shanghai, uh, Shanghai, Thailand. They've been supporting an orphanage over there for a long time, ten or twelve years. They've been in, Th- in Thailand, Thailand. Yeah, Tha- okay. Thailand, okay. Shanghai, Thailand. Um, so uh, we're having a, a whatever, a, a, and I love Thailand Day, and they're showing pictures and telling stories, and and they're trying to drum up support for the for the trip coming up, and and. And I've been chewing on this, and, and again, my whole, you know, they're up there and they're talking about it, and, and my whole head just fills up with go, you know, honor his promise, fulfill his commitment, fulfill his commitment, and, and go do that. And and that's what I did. I went and talked to the preacher that day. I talked to my wife and told her, and, you know, she knows, man, she's on board. So, uh, I mean, long story short, few months later, I'm on a plane fixing to go 32 hours to Chiang Rock, Thailand. I don't know if you've ever done anything like that, dude. It's a, it's a, it's a life changing thing to, to go and see and do and touch and feel. And it's my first trip out of the country. It's my first trip to a third world country. You know, I don't know how you can go and see it and do it and not change your perspective. You know, and that's really what it is, is a shift in perspective. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know how you can go and do it and not not have a change of heart. And so, I, and you got to remember, my head's a mess. I got a lot going on in my head. I just lost a child. I'm still chewing on this. Um, I go look, make this big, long, emotional, spiritual thing, uh, and I'm coming home. It's over. I'm coming home. I had I had thought about it on the plane ride home. I knew before I ever landed in Memphis, Tennessee. I was going to go again. I, I would. I would be back. Uh, so I'm walking through the, the airport in Memphis, Tennessee, and coming home. And my buddy Bobby Cabot walks up to me, and Bobby, uh, Bobby's been involved with the Thailand group for a long time. At that point, he had been involved for several years and was actually beginning to plan the trip and be involved in the legwork and, and acquiring the tickets and setting up my tent and those kinds of things. Uh, Bobby was also uh, a, a, an endurance athlete. Bobby had been running for several years and riding bikes and doing these rides and races and triathlons and these things for several years. Uh, he and I had, had become buddies. We both liked to cook, and we had done some barbecue together, and, and uh, uh, we had kind of become buddies. And so, you know, then we go to Thailand together. And, and so anyway, Bobby walks up to me walking through the airport in Memphis, and he says, you know, what did you think about the trip? And I said, it was great. And he said, would you do it again? And I said, oh, yeah. And we chit-chat for a few minutes. And, and long story short, I mean, he says to me, I, I, I'm thinking about doing this bicycle ride. And uh, he said, I think I can maybe raise some money for these kids over here at the orphanage. And I, I said, man, I said, I think that's a good idea. You know, I'll write you a check. I'll sponsor you. And he said, uh, "He said, would you do it with me? And at the time, dude, um, when all of this started, that, very first day, I was 298 pounds. I've had 
What? Dude, uh, I just I, I just saw you the other day. You're not 298. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not. Wow. Uh, my knees are blown to pieces. I've had a half dozen knee surgeries and, and three ACL injuries. And I didn't, you know, that's my immediate reaction, dude. I told Bobby, I said, man, I said, no way, man. I said, there, I said, no, sir. Uh, uh-uh, uh, I'm not, not interested. I'll write you a check. And, and Bobby, Bobby said, he knew exactly what he was doing. He said, he said, I think you should go and do this for Christopher. And he said, uh, he said, imagine, he said, and he, and, and he, and he looks back and he's, he, he's got his hands up like he's framing a scene, like he's a director framing a scene, right? And he says, imagine me and you riding bikes across Thailand, matching jerseys, and on the sleeve it says, in memory of Christopher Paul Norris. Imagine that right there. And he just kind of patted me on my shoulder and turned around and walked away. I mean, oh, he knew man. exactly what he was doing, dude. He knew exactly what he was doing. So, I, of course, I'm hooked, and I'm, I, I tell him, okay, you know, I'm in. Let's do it. And and I, did, I, I didn't know anything. I knew nothing. And, you know, about this time, we get to our families, and we haven't seen them in two weeks, so there's this humongous greeting, and we go through this, and we get our bags, and we're walking out. And as I'm, I'm walking out the airport, Bobby hollers at me across the parking lot. He says, hey, we're going to do the ride in Thailand. We're going to ride from Bangkok to Chiang Rai, Thailand. When you get home, Google it. And which that was a shock for me to hear that because I had immediately thought we would do the ride in the States, you know, somewhere here close. I never even considered the fact that we might do the ride in Thailand. And, and at that point, I had no concept of the geography of Thailand. I, I had no idea what the miles are. So I said, okay, and I go home, and I Google it. And the way home, I'm thinking, okay, maybe it might be 100 miles. He said he wanted to do five days. Maybe we'll ride 20 miles a day. I can get that. That's, I can do that. Not a big deal. And, and I go home, dude, and I Google it, and it's 486 miles. <laughs> and we have to ride it in five days. I almost had a heart attack. I mean, I just, I'm not kidding you, dude. I mean, I, I'm, not an, I'm not an endurance athlete. I played ball as a kid. I, I don't, this is not my thing. And, and I just was immediately scared to death. And... So, you know, I, I mean, again, long story short, dude, I get a bike, we start, I start riding on a trainer in the garage, I start cutting weight, um, I, I, I learned quickly, you have to learn how to do this, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm in, you gotta remember, I, I'm in, this is still, this is early on in my grief thing, and, and right. I had a lot of my son wrapped up in this in year one, and I committed to do this, and you know, come hell or high water, I, I'm fixing to, I'm going to do this. And if it's 10,000 miles, we're going to ride it. And, and I was really, really, really committed. And so I start cutting weight and I get in shape. And about this time, uh, we all realize that very few of us have the, have the equipment to do what we're trying to do. So, uh, we all realize we're going to have to go buy bikes. And about the same time, there's a bike shop, a new bike shop that opens up in, in uh, Midtown in Memphis, Tennessee, by the name of All About Bikes. Uh, good guys, Christian guys. Uh, they've done what's the name, work, what's the name of it again? All About Bikes is the name of the shop. And uh, they're good guys. They've done a little mission work themselves. Uh, they helped us out a lot early on with just knowledge and information and and. Uh, just, just good guys. Uh, but they started a, they started a, they were, they kept telling us, hey, you should come up on Wednesday nights. We do a ride on Wednesday nights. We, we make some burritos. We go downtown and, and hand out the burritos. And, and they asked us for like a year, but we were all so deep into training that first year because it was year one and nobody knew what we were doing and nobody was in shape. And to be honest with you, we didn't have time. And so it was months and months and months before we actually, Went and did the burrito night, you know, uh, we went before we went and did burrito night. Uh, we went to Thailand first before we actually went to burrito night the first time. Anyway, fast forward a few months, uh, well, fast forward a few years, you know, now, you know, this was 2011. You know, the, the goal was to ride 500 miles in five days. We just, it, burrito night started off as a fledgling ministry. 
with really just a bunch of hippie bicycle guys out of a house in midtown Memphis that were making a handful of burritos on Wednesday nights and riding downtown and handing it out to a handful of people. Okay, this is 2012. Fast forward to 2015. Uh, we are preparing for the fourth uh, ride in Thailand. It is now the Tour of Hope. Uh, we are a fi- we are filing for 501c3 status this year. Uh, we have raised over sixty thousand dollars for the for the orphanage in Shanghai. Wow! <laughs> in three years, uh, I've ridden over twenty thousand miles on a bicycle <laughs> in wow. three years, which is ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, just absolutely ridiculous. Uh, burrito yeah. night has turned into. Uh, UBFM, which is the Urban Bicycle Food Ministry, uh, it started off as a bunch of hippie bicycle guys, uh, just a few. And when we got involved, there was probably 20 people showing up regularly. Um, it had overtaken the the guy's house. His name is Tommy Clark, the guy that started it. And he kind of overtaken his house, really, when we got involved. Not long after we got involved, uh a Methodist church in downtown Memphis offered us space in the use of their commercial kitchen, uh, which shortened the ride because from Midtown to downtown Memphis and plus, you know, to ride around and back was like a 25 to 30 mile ride. Now we're stationed out of, out of downtown Memphis. It's an eight or 10 mile ride. There's a lot of people that can do an eight or 10 mile ride. Not many people can ride 25 or 30. So now some nights we'll have 40, 50 people showing up. We'll give out 400 or 500 burritos plus, all the blankets and, and coats and gloves and hot chocolate we can carry, they've rigged uh, trailers to carry coolers and we can get a hot, hot chocolate. It's, it's fully supported. I shouldn't say fully supported. They've got a, they keep a pretty steady of inventory. It's pretty steady supply of inventory uh, through various and uh, sundry ministries downtown. Um, they've got a couple of restaurants locally that are helping them out with food supplies plus what they get through donations. Uh, the Methodist Church has acquired a building next door, which they have donated to the Urban Bicycle Food Ministry, as well as another group that's going to start a mission downtown. So we're, they're, they've got their own space now. Uh, you know, it, 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 here's the thing, man. It, what started off as, you know, a few silly rednecks trying to get in shape and right across Thailand and make some money for these kids over there has turned into this, this thing, you know, this, yeah. there's all these supporters and we, you know, what started out with five or six guys, we now have 20 people that ride, you know, last year there was a group of 20 people, uh, seven riders, about six or seven support people, a couple of video people, plus the drivers of three vehicles going across Thailand last year. Uh, it, it's turned into this, thing and, and it, i mean who, who would have thought of it i mean bicycle man <laughs> man if you had told me five years ago that i was gonna be sitting here in the truck talking to you about the last three or four years of my life and the fact you know that we're preparing to go back for thailand for uh the fourth time now uh, i called you a liar you know uh but i, I said all along uh, you know, the death of a child can be a family killer. And and I just, I told my wife, I said, I'm not going to have it. I said, we're not, we're not, not, not going to crumble. Mm-hmm. That's a dishonor to, to my son. You know, I, I got a house full of girls, Conrad. I can't, can't, I can't let it go down like that. We had to find something to outweigh the bad. We had to find something good outweigh the bad and God sent the bike and I'll never not believe that nobody will ever tell me that that God didn't send the bike (laughs) because the concept of Mike Norris riding 500 miles on a bicycle in five days is probably the most foreign thing you can ever think of (laughs) yeah let me ask let me ask you about that I mean obviously you took 30 something hours to fly there and yeah. That, but how did how did you go four hundred and eighty something miles in five? How did how did that work? Well, there's you got to ship everything. We fly in. We we will arrive in Thailand uh, late Friday night Bangkok time. 
we'll go straight to the hotel, go by Team Crash, and we'll wake up Saturday morning. We we all got at this point. The first year we went, they we disassembled every bike completely, boxed it up, packaged it, boxed it up, shipped it, shipped it in a cardboard box. We have since found out they actually make travel cases for bicycles, which you know the first year it was a half a day process. Now it's about a fifteen minute process. You know, you pop the wheels off, pop the handlebars off, pack it in the box, shove it up, and go. So now you ship the bikes Saturday. Saturday morning we'll get up, reassemble the bikes. Um, we stay in touch pretty much year round with our contacts at the orphanage in Thailand. The pastor, his name's Sapot Fanon. Uh, I talk to him pretty regular. Plus now, uh, the same three or four young, young adults, the young kids, young guys, uh, we've got buddies over there now. And so we kind of stay in contact with them all pretty regularly. There's some sack. He's 22. Uh, there's Q, he's a teacher at the orphanage, and then there's J and K. You can't say their names, it's just way easier to, to go with first first letters, man. It's, it's way easier to trust <laughs> So uh, uh, we stay in contact with them pretty regularly, and they'll come down Saturday morning and bring a couple of vehicles, and we'll we'll spend Saturday acquiring supplies, water and food, and assembling the bicycles, loading the trucks, and then Sunday morning, we get up and ride, and it's pretty much 100 miles a day uh, uh, for five days. Now, we'll do some meet and greets along the way. Um, there's there's a there's an orphanage. There's a, a little bit of How fast do you guys go? Year one, we averaged 16.8 miles an hour. Uh, last year, we were a little over 20 miles an hour. We averaged 20.2 miles an hour. So, uh, absolutely, we, there was some progress. We almost looked like a, like a cycling team last year. It, it's been a cool thing to watch, man, from a bunch of reformed fat rednecks to, to what it was last year. It's been a cool thing to watch. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, God, God, I, I'm telling you, there's no way, and there's so many stories I could tell you about, uh, uh, about God's little appointments along the way, things that have just happened that there's no way it should have happened if God hadn't been involved. Uh, to, to just watch what's happened with this bicycle team in the last three or four years has been really, really cool to see and be a part of. So, but yeah, we averaged this year in time, we averaged a little over 20 miles an hour, 20.2 miles an hour. So, uh, day four, we, you go over a mountain, uh, 16.2 miles of straight up the side of the mountain, uh, and then it's a little over 18 miles down. So, uh, on the way down, you're riding the brakes at 45 miles an hour on a bicycle, which is which can get a little scary. People can contact you, Mike Norris. Absolutely. At ride, ride for him. Uh, the ride, the number four H I M, on Facebook, and I'll have the link wherever people, wherever you hear this podcast, I'll have the link to that Facebook page. So you absolutely, can, we'll get that to you. Amen. And obviously, I'm sitting here. I'm just watching God. There was some seed planted through tragedy, and I didn't know a bicycle burrito tree was going to come up. <laughs> you know, Thailand. Dude, I mean, it's just I'm amazing. I'm telling you, I'm telling you the way this thing. I'm telling you because it, it was such a, a a horrific thing and such a tragic thing, and and you know, my family was absolutely wounded, and 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 I didn't know what to do. I mean, I didn't know what to do. Uh, and then this comes along, and now, and, and you know, I mean, not only did it did it was it a good thing for me, was it a good thing for my family? Uh, you know, that first year, I, I went absolutely to honor a commitment that my son made. Absolutely, I went the second year because of the ride. You know, uh, uh, I just felt like it was the right thing to do. And I've been back ever since, not really to prove a point, but because I've got relationships with these people and with these people on the other side of the planet now. Uh, they count on us. They depend on us. They look forward to us coming. Uh, I'm not going to let them down. And, and I think, you got to think, you got to think, man, that that was part of the plan all along. And that's a bit of a harsh pill to swallow to think that you have to lose a child to get to this point. But, you got to think that there's a plan in this all along, and, and and when something happens like this, it's our job to find out what is God's plan in this, you know, and and I, that's what I'm trying hard to do. I, 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 there's really not been a Mike Norris plan all along, dude. I never planned any of this, but I promised myself, promised my son, 
that, that I would no longer, you know, I just wasn't going to let his story end on the side of the road in Meridian, Mississippi. He was going to be a good boy, and he was a good boy. He was going to be a better man than I am. And and I just think it's a shame that it ended. I'm not going to end like that for him. I'm, I'm just not. I'm just not. We're going to make good things happen out of this. You have to find out what God's plan is when tragedy strikes. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do, man. We're just, I'm just trying to open the doors that, that God opens for me. That's really it. Amen. You feel like praying this out, man? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for, I thank you for Conrad and, and his ministry and what he's doing, Lord. Uh, we, we'll never know the number of people that, that, that this man has touched and, and that this man has, has been able to minister to. Uh, I thank you for blessing him, Lord. Uh, I think even the people that are listening to this, Lord, I, I, there's, I've been saying for, for four years now that there is a reason that all this is happening. There's a reason that I hooked up with Conrad that somebody out there needed to hear this, Lord, and, 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 and tonight I'm praying for them. Uh, it doesn't have to end like that. It doesn't, you, you have to make a choice and, and you have to choose which side of the coin you're going to be on. And, and I'm, I pray for strength. I pray, I pray for strength for these people to get through the issues that they're going through. Uh, Father, I ask that you, you bless the ones that are listening. Uh, bless Conrad. Bless his ministry, Father. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Dude, I got to tell you, you know, Genesis 50, 20 is when Joseph is explaining to his brothers, you know, um, it says, you thought evil against me, but God meant it for, for good to bring past as it is this day to save much people alive. And I, I'm going to say, just looking at the fruit of the ministry, you know, you're definitely reaping a big yield here, man. I'm proud of you. I appreciate it. You know, I think Christopher would think all of this was, was really, really, really cool. So, that, that, I'm good, man. I promise. I'm good. I'm good. All right. Like I said, everybody can find Mike at Ride for Him. It'll be on the uh, Facebook, Ride the number four, H-I-M, and I'll have it everywhere you hear this podcast. Mike, thanks for being a part of Conrad Rocks, and thanks for having coffee with Conrad. We'll talk to you later, man. Thanks a lot. You know, after the interview, I got to talk to him some more. Mike's a really nice guy, and he was talking to me about divine appointments on the road. Um, you know, we could have, we could have had this interview go for 24 hours. God has been moving very mightily in Mike's life. And you know, what's interesting, he said he didn't plan anything. God just kind of lights up the very next step. Amen. When I edit these interviews, I tear up a little bit oftentimes. They start out as tears of sadness and then they turn into tears of joy. This was one of those times. God turned tragedy into triumph. You can find Mike Norris on Facebook at Ride for Him. That's Ride, the number four, Him. The link will be included wherever you hear this podcast. Thanks, Mike, for the interview. God bless you, man. Stay tuned to ConradRocks.net. Till we meet again, dig deeper. Go higher. Hi, this is John with John Shaba House. This is the kid renegade redeemed with Forever Redeemed Ministries. This is Amy from Amy Daily. This is Tiffany White with Hey Ministries. This is Dan the Coffee Man. This is Glenda Lincoln from WingsOfProphecy.com. This is Marianne Sampson from Google Plus. This is Charles Michael from France. With us, RacingMinistries.org. This is Monice from Keeper of God's Word.blogspot.com. Jackie Smith from the Intentional Christian Panure Podcast. This is Christy. Up ministry for women. This is Janet with Overcoming Abuse God's Way. Spreading hyphen joy.org. This is Gerald Thomas in New Hebron, Mississippi. This is Mordecai from Oklahoma. This is Vicki of Michael Towns of New Beginnings. This is Stephen Barrett from Holy Fire, Japan. We are adding on to you with Conrad. ConradRocks.net. Do you rule? <laughs> <laughs> Conrad Rocks. Conrad Rocks. Tune in radio.